Good morning, Sun Valley. Good to see you today. Thank you for being here. I am really looking forward to <clears throat> opening up our text today and uh, explaining it to you and encouraging you with it. I don't know how many of you were here the first time we preached through Romans, but if you were here, and you may not remember this, but we spent eight months in Romans 8, and we're trying to get through Romans 8 this time in eight weeks. And it's not that we've, we've decided that there's not as much information here that's important, it's just that uh, I'm leaving here in uh, mid-June and uh, taking a sabbatical, as most of you know. And so I want to try to uh, inject so, uh, Romans 8 here into your soul and have you think on these things for a few months and uh, see whether or not the Lord will do something great in you. And I know he will. This is, this is an amazing chapter. It is so full of so many important doctrines for the believer. This is not an exhaustive study, uh, this eight-week study of Romans 8, by any means. So if we don't unpack something um, to the level of your satisfaction, uh, dig into it yourself, all right? Uh, but what we're covering here is really a, a mountaintop or a bird's eye view of this wonderful chapter, Romans 8. Romans is really a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome uh, to remind them of how sinful people can be right with God. This letter contains really important information, how you and I, even though we're sinful, can be right with God. That's an amazing truth in and of itself. That, this letter unpacks all of this. It tells us how someone can have their sins forgiven and can be declared by God not guilty, even though they remain in sin. It details what our life is supposed to look like after that divine act of grace takes place. So after God stamps not guilty in your life, Paul explains in Romans what our lives ought to look like from that point forward. And so Romans 6 through 8 really is the theology of the Christian life. By the time we get to Romans 8, we've uncovered a lot of important information and we're ready to hear Paul say these words, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now we're coming to verse 18 through 27. And before we start unpacking that, I wanna remind you Verses 1 through 17 really is a description of the ministry of the Holy Spirit as we learn to walk daily with Christ. And, and like I said, this is what I want you thinking about. This is what I want to fill your hearts with. How do I walk with Christ faithfully day to day, day in and day out, no matter what I'm facing? And verses 1 through 17 teach us that the Holy Spirit is actively working in us to conform us to the image of Jesus. He's enabling us to live the Christian life as we've been called to live. And now in verses 18 through 27, Paul brings up a topic that's so important for every Christian to hear. And I want to encourage you right now to do everything you possibly can to set aside anything that might be in your mind that might distract you from what I'm gonna tell you in the next 30 minutes. This is critically important stuff for you. And I want to assure you that if you will pay attention with Bible in hand open, God is gonna bless you here in the next 30 minutes. I'm convinced that if anyone, any believer doesn't grasp the magnitude of the subject matter in these verses today, their Christian life will be dysfunctional and disappointing and they will spend most of their Christian life in defeat. And we don't want that, do we? We do not. You may even get so frustrated that you walk away if you don't grasp the magnitude of the information in these short verses. So Paul here in these verses is addressing the problem of suffering as a Christian. Suffering as a Christian. How should we think about suffering? How should we think about God who, who allows and even ordains suffering for his people? 
These few verses are really spiritual oxygen for anyone wishing to navigate the hard times of life. And we all have them, by the way. We, as Christians, must be able to think biblically about suffering. We, we, we have to get this, Christian friend. Many, like I said, have walked away from faith because they were unable to come to terms with this important issue. It would be very easy to conclude that something must be wrong with you if you're suffering. Um, something must be wrong with my faith. Maybe something's wrong with God. Maybe, maybe what I believe isn't accurate or true. This shouldn't be happening to me. I'm, I'm, I've been faithful. Many think that when they come to Christ and begin to live for him, that God ought to look out for them and make their life a little more comfortable, even better. Many think that becoming a Christian is the removal of problems, not the addition of problems. But what Paul wants us to know in these verses is that becoming a Christian doesn't mean life becomes easy. No, it takes on a new set of problems. Have you recognized that yet in the Christian life? We, we are now in opposition to the world. We now have a new sworn enemy who is actively working against us to destroy us. Satan is no longer ignoring us if we're in Christ. When we come to Christ, Satan and all his demons go on high alert and begin to take aim at us and are determined to bring us down. As much as we would like to think that we're immune to suffering, that is not the case as Christian. We all get sick, our children drift, our financial problems mount, our marriages struggle, and then we have the added and new challenge of a powerful enemy who wants to bring us down. That's what we're facing. Paul wants you to know it, but he wants you to know that along with that reality, there's hope, good hope. Paul wants us to see the God-intended purpose of suffering. He wants us to see that in order to become like Christ, we must endure suffering as Christ did. If Jesus suffered, then we must suffer if we expect to be like him. This is what it says in verse 17. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. So what helps us navigate our suffering? that we will inevitably face, or you are currently facing. How are you gonna navigate it? How are you gonna keep your faith and your joy when your life is crumbling all around you? Paul tells us in this passage, surviving suffering requires three things according to this passage. And these three things begin with the right perspective. Verse 18 through 22, it says this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Paul wants us to have a right perspective. Having a right perspective is an important part of every area of life, isn't it? A perspective helps you navigate life. Here Paul is saying, let's have a right perspective about suffering. There's no better time to have a right perspective than when you're facing suffering. God intends suffering to wean us from the world. It, it helps, that is, suffering helps us focus on the things of God. It, it keeps our mind on the things above instead of the things on the earth. Suffering rips out our love of the world by its roots. If you've been through suffering, you know what I mean. You, you cannot suffer as a Christian and remain attached to the world, which is why we must suffer. Suffering is a big part of our sanctification. This is why Paul includes it here in Romans chapter 8. It's such an important part of the Christian life. God uses our suffering to purify us, to refine us, to make us like Jesus. He uses our hardships for his glory and, and our good. It's a way of waking us up. It's a way of keeping us humble, keeping us dependent, looking to Jesus. That's what suffering does. Suffering also helps us encourage and comfort others. The burden of suffering helps us identify with those who, around us who are suffering as much or more than we are. It gives us credibility in life. You've been through that, well, now you can talk to me. This is what suffering does for us. 
The world is full of people who suffer. How are you going to relate to them unless you suffer? <laughs> Suffering is also given to us that, that we have opportunity to exalt God to those who don't know him. One of, the, one of the most opportune times for people to come to faith is when they're suffering. And, and if you have suffered, if you have gone through what they're going through, you have something to say, something to, to speak into their lives. And that thing is Christ. People come to Christ when they come to an end of themselves. And so suffering draws the human soul to the things of God. And when that happens, we can be there with an answer, with a hope. There's a lot of false teaching surrounding this idea of suffering. Some think that if you just have enough faith, you shouldn't suffer as a Christian. Others say, if you're not being obedient, then you're going to suffer. Well, these are both wrong. No, there isn't a Christian who will make it through this life unscathed by suffering. God specifically and intentionally designs your sufferings for you. Can I say it this way? Your sufferings are custom made by God for you. You remember Job, right? He was a righteous man, and he was singled out by God to suffer. You remember Abraham, had a great life in Ur. God called him out of Ur into a desert to suffer, to learn how to be a friend of God. You remember the disciples of Jesus, those 12 weak and insufficient men who were in the middle of learning what it meant to walk with Christ. In their weakness, at the height of their weakness, Jesus sends them out onto the Sea of Galilee in the middle of the night by themselves for what reason? To suffer. To suffer. James, the epistle of James which is about genuine faith, signs of genuine faith, begins the epistle by saying or encouraging us to think joyfully about suffering. Consider it joy when you encounter suffering. James begins his epistle with. Suffering is a part of the Christian life. One of the proofs that we are in a relationship with Jesus is that we suffer and that we suffer well. In verse 17 here in Romans 8, Paul said that we are children and heirs provided we suffer with him. If you're his, you will suffer. That's the first thing we've got to get into our head. We've got to have that perspective. Why does Paul introduce the subject of suffering here at this point in Romans 8? Because he's teaching us as Christians what to expect about the Christian life. You're going to suffer, Christian friend. If you're breathing, you will continue to suffer. So the Apostle Paul sanctifies the idea of suffering and helps us understand God's purpose in it. This is what these verses are about between 18 and 27. He introduces the idea of suffering in verse 17 and then unpacks how to deal with it in verses 18 through 27. The word for in verse 18, you see that in your Bible? The first word of verse 18 is for. It's a, it's a word that points to the explanation of what has already been said. And what he's referring to is what's been said in verse 17. The only way to collect on your inheritance, Paul is saying, is by suffering. Oh, we have a great hope for inheritance, right? Yeah, one day. But Paul says the only way to that inheritance is through suffering, through the groaning path. That's the perspective we must begin with. Can't have one without the other. So we need to have a right perspective. And that right perspective here in verse 18 begins with an important comparison. Look at verse 18 again. He wants us to compare two things. Suffering with what? Future glory. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed in us. Let's compare these two things Paul is saying. And this word consider is an important word. It's really referring to a mathematical calculation in the original language whereby someone can come to a conclusion. 
It's just math, Paul is saying. Comparing our present suffering against future glory, we, if we'll just do that, Paul says, it'll help you navigate your circumstances. Paul wants us to objectively examine the facts. Present suffering, future glory. Examine the two of them, weigh them against one another. The word there, consider, is logizomai in, in Greek, logizomai. Did you hear a mathematical term there? Logizomai, logarithm is where we get the word. It's simply math, Paul is saying. It's a mathematical equation. Just do the simple math and you will come to the right conclusion. This is really helpful. This isn't some subjective thing, it's objective, it's, it's concrete. Paul wants us, his readers, to carefully evaluate the issue of suffering against what is awaiting us in heaven. How does that turn out? <laughs> it's obvious. If, if we'll just look at it, we'll make decisions and hold attitudes in light of this comparison and think and act the right way. And, and to, to clarify, these are real sufferings. Notice that the word sufferings is plural, meaning there's more than one, just more than a couple. They're multiple. We will run into them daily as a Christian. But these sufferings are real sufferings because he, he's using this grand reality of the future, this glory that we're all hoping and expecting against our suffering. So these sufferings must be substantial. They're real. They're life-altering type of things. These are like getting sucker punch type of sufferings, uh, having a ton of bricks fall on you type of sufferings. These sufferings include facing death in our family or facing death ourselves, or in, the suffering includes loss of a job, loss of health, loss of relationships, loss of investments, loss of reputations, real life, hardcore suffering. Paul's encouraging us to keep our suffering in perspective. You can't allow your suffering to undo you, discourage or derail you. Paul is teaching us that the way to keep suffering from stealing our joy, from shipwrecking our faith, is to keep it in perspective. Compare, listen, compared to the glory that awaits us, I can confidently say with Paul, none of us has ever had a bad day. Ever. That's what Paul is saying here. Compared to what we have waiting for us when we see Jesus face to face, our suffering, no matter what it is, is insignificant. Notice also that the glory that we are comparing to suffering in verse 18 isn't clear yet. Verse 19, it's, it's, a, it's not, it's 18, the end there. It's to be revealed. It hasn't yet been revealed. It's still totally unknown to us. We, we only have small glimpses of this future glory in Scripture, but what we see is impressive enough. We have enough information to compare it against our current sufferings. Wouldn't it be great if someone who's already been there, like R.C. Sproul, could come back and just talk to us for 10 minutes? He would begin with this. What's wrong with you people? Right? He would say... Friends, it is so worth it. Hang on. Keep on. Keep trusting. Keep living. It is worth it. Just get there. So if we combine scriptural glimpses of the glory that is to be revealed, if we combine that with our faith, if we combine that with the truthfulness of Jesus, we can sustain our joy and our faith no matter what sufferings we face. Remember what Jesus said in John 14 to his fearful disciples. I'm going away for a little bit, but I'm going to come back and get you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you that you're not going to believe. Turn with me quickly. You keep your thumb in Romans 8. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. I want to give you <clears throat> a taste of these things to help whet your appetite, to, to build your anticipation of the things that we will yet face, that we will yet see uh, someday. Chapter 21 of Revelation, verse 4, and if you really want to get the full flavor of this thing, read all of 21 and all of 22. 
And the longer you read these two chapters, the less and less important you, your trials and sufferings become. But listen to verse four. He, referring to God, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, speaking of us who are there, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, no crying, no pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The next verse says, and everything will be new. <laughs> that sounds pretty good to me. That, that's just a, a small little picture of what awaits us who know Christ. Paul's asking us to compare these two things on a scale. Okay, put your sufferings on this side and future glory on this side, and what's going to happen to this scale? Mm. There is no comparison to the weight of glory that we have to look forward to. Suffering doesn't even tip the scales when measured against glory. You say that you can't put up with another day of the physical pain? Paul's saying, yes, you can. Just compare it to glory. You say you can't work another week for your boss. You can't live another day with your spouse or take another disappointment with your kids or your finances or your health. Paul's saying, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Weigh it against the future glory. Have the right perspective. It's only a lifetime that we live. And then eternity. Those in glory, including R.C., would say it's so worth it. Paul says, do the math. These sufferings are nothing compared to the glory ahead of us. Your present sufferings is light compared to this weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he said the same thing to the Corinthians who were suffering. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And if there's any Christian who's ever suffered, it was Paul. And he said it's light and momentary. It's like a, a whiff of smoke and gone. He says, have the right perspective. Secondly, the important expectation. Not only does this right perspective include the important comparison, but as we get down to the next couple verses, especially verse 19, he says, have an important expectation. Look what it says in 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. This answers why we should endure patiently the suffering that we face. Remember what the word for means? At the beginning of 19, he uses another word, for, in order to explain verse 18. This is why we should suffer patiently, verse 19 says, because one day the revealing of the sons of God will take place. What's he talking about? He's talking about the second coming of Christ. On that day, God will reveal who were his, who will live with him forever. The revealing of the sons of God. And then verses 20 through 22, we see some strange talk. Look at it. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. What's Paul talking about? He's talking about the curse and how it bound all creation, including mankind, to suffering. The, the, the creation is even groaning. It, it's, it's speaking about the curse. Do you realize that all creation was affected by Adam and Eve's sin? The animal kingdom, the inanimate world was all affected. When man fell into sin, death entered creation, decline, deterioration, the second law of thermodynamics, the demise was a part of the curse. Creation is groaning, waiting, looking forward to when everything will be restored. When it is, it will be a glorious day. One day the curse will be lifted, Paul said, and the creation will rejoice. <laughs> the creation, like Narnia, rejoice. All suffering and sorrow will come to an end. And so navigating suffering well, friends, requires a right perspective. Do you have that perspective? 
You think of future glory when you're going through hard times. That's what Paul said is the first stop. Secondly, verses 23 through 25, he speaks of a good hope. And not only the creation, but we ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Let's look at these verses. You know that biblical hope, of course, is different than secular hope, right? Secular hope is that kind of wishful thinking that uh, we have when we're thinking about how the Mariners are going to do this season or how the weather's going to be this weekend. Well, we, I hope it's sunny tomorrow. We're going camping. That's wishful thinking. That is not biblical hope. Biblical hope is vastly different than that. Biblical hope is like anticipation of something certain. God has promised it, and our hope is the anticipation of receiving that promise. Our hope must be very strong, Paul says, in order to survive this world, in order to navigate disappointments and sorrows. Our hope must be certain, and it is. What keeps us getting up, going to work, working on our marriages, raising our kids, sacrificing our time, is something in the future, something sure. Paul is saying we must live our present lives with a future orientation. We must have that good hope. You've heard it said, this person is so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. You heard of that? Well, that's, there's no such person. That person doesn't exist. Some godly thinkers have rightly said they're no earthly good until they are sufficiently heavenly minded. This is what Paul is saying. This is what he said to the, the Colossians. He says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things of the earth. Very few of us set our minds on the things above as we should. Most of us struggle with our sufferings more than we ought because we don't set our minds on the things above. We set them on earthly material things. Not thinking about Christ, not thinking about his kingdom, is much of the reason we struggle with suffering as we do. So in these verses, Paul is calling us to live our Christian life with a strong hope of future glory. That's what we hope for. This stabilizes us. It solidifies our faith in hard times. If we try to live our life without future hope in God, we forfeit joy, we forfeit peace. This is what it says in Romans 15, 13. Paul speaking, may the God of hope, he's called the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. When we hope in God, his joy, his peace floods our souls. That's what Paul's saying. We must have hope to navigate suffering. And this hope is which is for which what we groan, we groan for this. And we groan inwardly, it says in verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of the body. And, and we, we groan because we are under the same curse that creation is under. And the we there is referring to Christians, to those of us who are in Christ. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. What is that? What's Paul talking about there? Well, remember, he's, he's giving us strategies to deal with suffering, and this strategy is to have a future hope that is sure and certain. And the idea is that God has provided a full harvest, but he's only given us the first fruits. The rest of the harvest is yet to come. And the first fruits in this case, of course, is the Holy Spirit. We've received the first fruit of all that is yet to come, all that we have yet to, to experience with Jesus Christ and eternity with him, is given as by way of a taste with the Holy Spirit. He comes, he enters, he nurtures, he uh, relates to us, which is just a taste of what will come. And so we see here that the Holy Spirit is just the first taste of knowing God, of relating to him, of living forever with him. Next, we, this hope is for which we wait eagerly. What's it say there? We, we eagerly await the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. It's the idea there that eager awaiting, the idea in the word means a craning of the neck. Like when you're at the airport and a person that you love's coming and you're, you haven't seen them for months and you crane your neck to look around the crowd to see if you can find that person. That's what's in view here. 
It's a craning of the neck, looking forward to what is to come, eagerly awaiting. When's Jesus going to get here? Kind of idea. Are you eager to see Jesus? Are you eager to be in your new eternal body? Now, I want you to, I'm sure some of you are saying, wait a minute. We're awaiting the adoption of sons? I thought he said we're already adopted just a few verses earlier. And this is true. We are, of course, adopted. We're adopted now in Christ. Um, but there is so much more to our adoption than simply the inclusion into his family, so much more than the forgiveness of sins. There's more to our inheritance than that. And I'm just not just going to say just that, because forgiveness of sins and inclusion in his family is massive, isn't it? It's wonderful. But listen, it's so much more. <laughs> the adoption of sons includes so much more than that. Hear Paul on this, Sun Valley Church. We are sons, but there's more awaiting us in the future, so much more. Our inheritance, he says here, includes resurrected bodies, bodies like Jesus had after he came out of the tomb. That's, that's on the list. It includes uninterrupted fellowship with Jesus. Now we have interrupted fellowship all the time, right? We, we're in a fight with our wife, interrupted fellowship. We're sick, interrupted fellowship. We forget to do our, da our daily quiet time for a day or two or a week or two or a month. Interrupted fellowship. Then, never interrupted fellowship. Never. Continual absence of sin. Eternal joy. Friends, we have a redeemed soul living in an unredeemed body. One day, this body will also be redeemed. One day we will see Jesus face to face. Which is why we can say with the Apostle John at the end of, at the end of Revelation, Come, Lord Jesus. Do you ever pray that? Come, Lord Jesus. I don't want to go to the dentist. <laughs> Come, Lord Jesus. We eagerly await a fully redeemed body with no cavities. John Stott says, and this is interesting, we are only half saved right now. Of course, we're fully saved, right? But you know what he means, right? We have all of that to look forward to. We are saved, our relationship with God is secure, but our salvation isn't yet fully experienced. It's yet to be revealed. And this hope is to which we were saved. Look at verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. <clears throat> Did you hear that when, when you were first considering Christ? Did you hear from anybody at any time when, when you were considering your need for Christ that your salvation included these wonderful things in the future? Most of us did, right? This is the hope that was laid out for us. This is one of the attractions of the gospel, isn't it? Not only the forgiveness of sins, but the future in glory. To this hope you were saved. <laughs> what a wonderful hope. This is, this is what we have awaiting us. When we see Jesus, everything about us will be redeemed. The redemption of our bodies will be complete. No sorrow, no suffering, no sin, only joy. When we get there, we will receive a glorified body which will be able to love Jesus, worship Jesus, serve Jesus with no hindrances. What a tremendous hope this is. But Paul said here in that verse, verse 24, it remains a hope. If you're reading this, you haven't yet experienced it. It remains out there, which is the carrot that God has supplied for those of us who are trudging through this suffering life. It's in the future. It is God's way to assist, to assist us to keep on keeping on, to help us to continue to persevere. Remember your future, Paul's saying. This is what also keeps us patient. Look at verse 25. 
It says, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Waiting for what? It's this redemption of our bodies, the presence of God, the, the, the glory with Christ. That's what it refers to in verse 25. But the word if here is a little bit confusing, but if we hope, he's not saying if like we would use if, it's better translated since, but since this is our hope, we wait patiently. That's what Paul wants us to say or to understand. And the word hope here, or not hope, but patience in verse 25, the word patience is a helpful word to understand in the original language. It's hupomone, hupomone, it's two words. It's a compound Greek word. And mone means to abide, and hupo means under, like hypodermic needle. It's hupomone, to abide under, to put up with, to, to keep on, is the idea, patiently persevering in the Christian life in the face of suffering, in the face of hardship. You abide under it patiently. Why? How? Looking with a right perspective to the future. We don't collapse like those around us would that don't have Christ. We have a hope that's so strong, so certain, so clear, we can persevere and not give up and not be undone by our circumstances. That is what the Christian hope does for all of us who will keep this perspective, this hope in view. So do you want to survive the challenges that you're facing, that you're going to face? Inevitably, you will face these and difficult ones. Do you want to persevere through those dark times? Then you must grab a hold of the hope that Paul is describing and lean into it. We must keep a right perspective, keep a good hope. We have so many wonderful things in front of us. And thirdly, the third thing that will help you navigate the sufferings of life in this passage is found in verse 26 and verse 27, and it's divine help. Look at this. I hope you're listening with a pen or pencil in your hand. I hope you're scribbling all over your Bible, but listen to these verses. Likewise, referring back how to navigate suffering, likewise, along with hope and along with perspective, also, he's saying, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Divine help along the way is the third thing. The helper, of course, we know Jesus introduced us to the helper in John 16, remember? I'm going away so that the helper can come and help you along the way in your Christian life. He, he, what's he do here in verse 26? Besides other things, he's praying for us. He's groaning for us, interceding for us. Verse 26 and 20, verse 27. Now, we all know the importance of prayer in the Christian life. We need others to pray for us. Prayer, I think, is a wonderful gift God has given to his people. Uh, we have the privilege of accessing God for one another. When a vibrant Christian finds himself in difficulties, what does he do or she do? Calls Christian brothers and sisters and says, will you pray for me, right? We all have experienced that. When we get together in our small groups throughout the week, we spend a time every single week praying for one another. And here we have the Holy Spirit doing that for us. I mean, it's one thing and a wonderful thing to have Christians pray for us who may or may not know the whole story. But how about this? God's praying for you. You're saying, how can God pray to himself? Well, because he's a trinity. That's why. The Holy Spirit here in verse 26 and 27 is praying to the Father and the Son. A little bit further, we see that Jesus is interceding for us also. So Jesus is praying to the Spirit and the Father. We have God praying for our needs, God praying for our strength, God praying for our ongoing hope. What a blessing this is. If anyone knows the will of God and the purpose of our suffering, he does. And so when he prays, he knows exactly our needs and how to pray for them. So we see here in verse 26 that the Holy Spirit is involved in this challenge of suffering. The Holy Spirit helps us in our human weakness that we all experience, Paul said. Now, I want you to look at the word helps in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps. 
This is a very important Greek word. The English word helps does not do justice to what Paul is saying. Helps can be like you help a person across the street. How simple is that? Hang on to my arm, I'm gonna help you across the street. That's wonderful and good. This help is so substantially more, it's unbelievable. The English word helps has five letters. The Greek word that Paul used actually has 17 letters. It's so significant. And this is a compound word in the original language made up of three Greek words. So Paul is using the root word and then adds two two prefixes to the front of that word to highlight the importance of what the Holy Spirit is actually doing. It's like Paul is using a highlighter pen in his original manuscript to help his readers see the importance of what the Holy Spirit is doing. So if you have a pen right now or a highlighter, the word helps ought to be circled and highlighted and arrowed. Listen why. The word communicates that the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us weak people, powerfully takes hold of us, and pulls us along in the Christian life. That's why the word needed 17 letters. That's what the word means. This word communicates that the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us weak people and powerfully takes hold of us and pulls us along in the Christian life. It's like a moving sidewalk at the airport. You're walking, sure, but this moving, this moving sidewalk is moving you along, taking you in the direction at a greater speed that you want to go. Likewise, the Holy Spirit powerfully is working in us, pulling us towards Christ with him. That's what the word helps means. It's, it's a word, it's a verb that is in the present tense, meaning the Holy Spirit is currently doing that always in your life. There's never a time where he takes a vacation from doing that in you. He is actively always working in us. The word also is in the active voice. This verb helps, which means he's energetically involved in encouraging you and drawing you and strengthening you. It's also in the indicative mood, which Paul uses when he wants to communicate a fact. This is happening, is what the word means. The Holy Spirit is, in fact, helping you. There's no doubt. The reason, the reason that this level of intense involvement of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life is necessary, it says in verse 26, because of our weakness. Because of our weakness. Now you say, oh, I'm weak, really? I'm that weak? Well, Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. The Apostle Paul here says, our weakness, so it includes the Apostle Paul. So the answer is, yes, you're weak. I'm weak. We're all weak, and we need the Holy Spirit if we're going to navigate suffering. We need a good perspective, a right perspective, a good hope, and divine help to navigate suffering. This is critical, Christian friend. You may think that it's not, but oh, friends, please hear me. Hear Paul. The Holy Spirit is at work in us because we need him to be. He's interceding. What's an intercessor do? He pleads the case of another. The Holy Spirit is there beside us, in us, for us, helping us, dragging us towards Christ every moment of every day. Don't think that you've got this godly structure to your life and you've got it figured out and it's because I'm doing my devotions. No, (laughs) it's because the Holy Spirit's there dragging you towards Christ. What a blessing it is, this perspective, this hope, this divine help. Aren't you thankful for it? Let's pray. Fathers, we come now to the conclusion of our time together. Our hearts are overflowing with joy and expectation as we consider these things that Paul has laid out for us in these few verses. Father, I do ask that you, by your Holy Spirit's power, would grab hold of us and pull us Christward. And in that, give us a right perspective. Help, help us to 
do the math, to, to look at our suffering and measure it against our future glory. I pray that you would, by the Holy Spirit, remind us of this good hope that is for every person who is in Christ. Help us not be waylaid by our sufferings and, and help us not to turn inward and away from you, but help us to run towards you. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would, that you would just sink deep into the marrow of our soul and draw us Christward. Help us to become more like Jesus. Help us to, to navigate suffering as Jesus did, totally dependent on the Father, um, acknowledging the work of God in us for his glory and our good. And I pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.